Yeah, we're going. Ready? Yeah. Hey everyone, it's VHS Masker Radio. I'm your host, Tom Seymour. And I'm your other host, Ken Powell. And uh, thanks for joining us on Twitch, on YouTube, on Podbean, and on Stitcher Radio, uh, and iTunes, yes. and other various places. So for those of you who don't know who we are, what this show is, um, we created the documentary VHS Massacre, and we've been running a podcast for uh, off and on for about six years. Formerly, we're New York Cinema Radio, but recently, uh, we've just been kind of feeling like um, the sort of VHS era is sort of the way to go. I don't know. Thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, I think I talked about it before. Like, I, it, it was like a kind of a call to arms, the VHS, you know, branding it that. So it allows us to maintain the focus on that while New York Cine, or New York Cinema um, was kind of like a more broader thing. Um, so this allows us to kind of maintain that focus uh, on this VHS, you know, in the, all the cult movies from that area, the B movies. And uh, we need to have like a first guest sometime too. Yes, absolutely. Um, we, you know, we may have um, um, Cat Card, who who was a uh, 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 whatever partner to John Gorman, got me into the slime, um, the slime. Uh, I'm sorry, melt films, the melt genre, the subgenre of horror. Um, not to be busting your chops right now. Yeah. I think your face might be melting a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I know. I think I need a little. <laughs> I think I need a little of this. Well, I would say like right, right here, right here, right here on this side. Right this on side, this right side? There. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You got, uh, you got the melting. It's hot in here. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So the melt melt genre is this really uh, fascinating thing. Uh, uh, we actually asked a uh, Facebook question. Um, so I don't know. Maybe you could get into that the Facebook question. Yeah, uh, yeah. The Facebook question so of the week. It was like. Uh, you know what is your favorite melt film? So it's been a been a hot minute since I did a Facebook question, but yeah, I didn't um, know about this genre of melt films until I think it was maybe at not your previous birthday, but the one before that. Whenever I think John Gorman and, and Cat, yeah, kind of debut. I think maybe Street Trash. Street Trash, yeah, which is the first time I'd ever heard melt films talked about. Yeah, Street Trash is 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 fantastic. You know, possibly the Cadillac of uh, the melt <laughs> film genre. Um, so, uh, I asked, what is your favorite melt film? Uh, Jason West said Street Trash. Um, of course, uh, Kat and John, Kat goes, I feel, I feel like John and I deserve a, a guest spot for this one. You got it. Uh, no problem. We'll make it happen. Um, Dylan Rorig says Street Trash. Cat Card, Street Trash. Uh, Justin McConnell, Street Trash with Body Melt. Is a close second, and I have not seen Body Melt. I haven't seen that one either. Um, Matthew Ford. I had to think about this for a second. He says RoboCop. RoboCop. Uh, Mel film. Yeah. Remember that one scene where the guy drives into the toxic waste in the van, yeah. and he melts. I, I, I get the, the, that was also my my question too of, of what exactly qualifies a film as a Mel film. I I would not put RoboCop in there. Um, yes, there is a melt scene, but I think it's not in the spirit of melt. Melt film to me is like the centerpiece is the melting. You know. Yeah. Well, the film that we watched for this week that we're going to review later, I would think definitely qualifies as a melt film. I haven't seen Street Trash, from my understanding, that's a melt film. And yes. then There's another more popular film in there that we we actually reviewed when we were New York Cinema Radio. Oh, you're probably talking about the stuff. stuff. Yes. Yes. I think that would kind of qualify too. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, that's sort of like a. Yeah, that's right. Meteor crashes to the planet. People start drinking this thing for no reason. Yeah. So, yeah. This. Well, I mean, we got it, jizz. But uh, Benjamin Height says uh, T two are Raiders of the Lost Ark. So it's like, I like those answers because you're like, oh yeah, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. There was melt. There was a quality melting scene. Yeah, absolutely. Um. You know, T2, uh, Arnold melts at the end, and then the T2 is always liquidy. Always melting, and... Yeah. I mean, T2 might actually qualify more than maybe, even though I think um, Ready to the Last Dark have the better melt scene. Yeah. I think T2 might qualify more as a melt because, I mean, the Terminator, the T2, or the T, what was it, the T1000? Yeah. He is consistently melting. He consistently is melting. Melt. Yeah. yeah. These are sort of trick answers, right? Um, 
Uh, Joseph says street trash. Ronald Drakenberg says dead alive. Dead That's alive. interesting. Yeah, yeah. That... There's definitely so much gut, guts and goo melting. Mm. I don't know. Well, that's why I'm saying like the the the, the definition. Maybe yeah. we need to work on 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 that exactly. Poultry guys is put in there by um uh Hosa uh, Concepcion who actually uh, works for Trauma. Um, yeah, there was some melting in there for sure. Yeah, yeah. But there was a lot of variation. There was like egg hatching and people's breasts and like people's faces turning into chickens and uh, a lot of a lot of variation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, and you can go through Trauma's catalog, and I'm sure you can find probably a few hundred milk films in there. Uh, I mean, even the Toxic Avengers have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, and, you know, he falls in the toxic waste, he turns into, there's a lot of, like, deep fryer yeah, deep. and stuff like that, you know. Uh, Matt Ford also says, Gren Gremlin's ending, definitely melting in the yeah. end. Uh, I think there's, like, a, a Wizard of Oz reference in there. Yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't, because if you're going to count Robocop, then you have to count like Wizard of Oz and Wizard of Oz is not a melt film. So we're, <laughs> no. so it's, that's some. Um, because we don't want your, you know, like you saying, oh, Wizard of Oz is a melt film. It's safe for my children now to watch uh, Slime City, our movie for this week or Street Trash or one of these others because it's definitely not, it's a very tame melt uh, scene compared to some of these other works. Yes. And, uh. So what our movie was um, uh, this week was the 1988 Melt classic, uh, Slime City. And uh, yeah, so Slime City, you know, do you want to set people up on this or? Uh... Well, yeah, so it, it starts off here in New York City. Again, like you know, our last four films now have been set here in the city. Uh, and this one, architecturally, I it might have been a story of, like I... I had a hard time placing it exactly, but it definitely is New York because of all the brownstones. Um, and it was very sad. This is not about the film, but seeing that apartment that they used and realizing like apartments haven't changed too much interior wise. Like they still have that like you know shitty white, um, the same fridges and the same ovens, and uh, it's kind of sad. It made me depressed about my own building. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. hasn't changed in thirty years. Yeah, that makes me want to look up is uh slime city where was slime city shot yeah it, all i could find was new york city but i couldn't find a specific location it like i say um the exteriors definitely made me feel like um astoria or or somewhere in brooklyn either one uh, yeah I, I had for me i i it felt like this could have been down the block so yeah um yeah it just says new york city sort of gen general yeah but um yeah, um, so this is directed by uh, Greg Lamberson, who I think believe I believe has a long history in the melt genre. Um, he did the follow up, um, Slime City Massacre, starting starring uh, a friend of ours, uh, Miss Debbie Roshan, um, who we're going to be interviewing on uh, Sunday. Should be really interesting, really cool. Yeah, I guess which would be kind of like the unofficial or official start of VHS Massacre, the sequel. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, before you know, so for, before I forget, so uh, the cast, right? We have uh, the character Alex, played by uh, Craig Sabin. Uh, Lori slash Nicole is Mary Huner. T J Merrick is Jerry. Uh, Dennis Embry is Roman. Um, Dick Beale is Detective <laughs> Irish. I looked that name up. I looked at the cast list tonight. I chuckled in too when I first looked at Dick Bill. Dick Bill. I, I was thinking of Dick Bill whenever I was reading it or something. <laughs> um, yeah, but Greg Greg Lamerson, um that, that follow up isn't that old actually that came out um no, it was like maybe ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, two thousand ten. But he's done films that I you know, that are in the sort of um if you follow horror you've heard of. Like Killer Rack came out in twenty fifteen. Um, you know, Dry Bones and um so he's i mean if you look at his producer credits it's just all, he's done a lot of stuff but um so um creepers gave up the ghost slime city massacre gruesome naked fear making slime underlying love slime city so i think part of his legacy is uh slime 
uh, sorry, Melt films. Melt films, but specifically the I guess the slime, the two slime city films, um, which you know, uh, we guess yeah, the plot of the movie is we have the, the main character Alex, he's looking for a new apartment and he picks out this building. Like I say, it looks looks like Queens, so I'll say it's Queens, and um, he moves in and he's like he. Like surrounded by, by like all these different weirdos. Yeah, right. It, this is like um, you would have to imagine they probably shot in the mid eighties, and it probably yeah. came out in the in the in the late eighties. But you had like um, yeah, they they're sort of punk, right? It's sort of like almost pre goth, right? They're yeah. sort of like Roman is like this spiky haired kind of punk light poet. You yeah, know? I would say these guys probably like the Cure a lot. Everyone with the Cure, concerts, right? Okay, and, okay. You know, um, uh, not too heavy in the eyeliner, but yeah, they're definitely like a, a punk feel to everybody that's kind of living in this apartment with the main, which I can never nail down her name, the really young lady who who wore like the spandex and like I was, it, it, I was just kind of waiting for her to get naked and she never did. Yes, uh, I think that you know, uh, with this type of film, you're, there are certain expectations, and what Joe Bob Briggs would would call um, trash cinema. Um, he said that very lovingly. But I would say that too, very lovingly. Trash cinema. Um, it's it's great stuff. Um, but yeah, as far as um, you know that that actress, you keep waiting for some of the staple of that genre, and that would be you know brief nudity. Yeah. Um, let's see. Lizzie, maybe Jane Doniger. Uh, oh, I I found her. Ruby, she, or... is she? She? Yeah, I think she is. Yeah, Jane Doniger. Um, she, uh, with most of this cast, they don't have too many credits outside of Slime City. Um, so I'm I'm guessing a lot of they might have been part of the local punk scene themselves, and that's the reason why they were they were chosen. Um, but I will say, like, uh, yeah, plot wise. Alex moves in. He's the new neighbor, um, whose other neighbors are kind of weird. He has a girlfriend, who they don't ever really push her to be the the overbearing girlfriend, but she definitely is the curious girlfriend. Whenever and for good reason though, like he starts acting very strange. Yeah. Um. So. Um. He. So the the main character is interesting. He's supposed to be a college student. They're all sorts of supposed to be college students. They sort of look to be late twenties to me, um, you know, uh, mid to late twenties, they're all in, must be graduate school. Must, they must all be doing MFAs cause they're all artists apparently. Yeah. Um, so, um, and the main character works in a video store, which was kind of a nice, uh, surprise, you know, kind yeah. of made the film feel very like, Oh, okay. I'm glad this was a good film to pick. Um, and, uh, so what happens is he moves into this apartment and uh, they, they they talk about how really nice this apartment is. And you go up and it would it'd be sort of um, standard dumpy by contemporary New York standards. But for some reason, they just were like, oh, this is so nice. And it's clearly not nice. Um, if you're a fellow New Yorker, you have seen this apartment, either you live in it or... You know, people who live in it, it's very much, uh, yeah, a, a very standard, not much has changed in a New York City apartment. Yeah. So. Your, your dirty white walls, your old appliances, yeah. your, you know, worn out floor. And they were old appliances even for then. Even for then, yeah. yeah. That refrigerator was like from the 50s, yeah. you know. Um, so basically the main character sort of befriends this, um, you would call her... Uh, a siren? A siren, yeah. Uh, she's dressed in sort of uh, lingerie all the time, walking around the city, apparently. Um, and so he befriends a few of people. Uh, this one guy, Roman, is like, enjoy this delicious um, pudding. And Yo so <laughs> yogurt, this delicious, he calls it like some kind of like, I don't know, Tibetan yogurt or something. Himalayan. Himalayan, Himalayan yogurt, yogurt, right? And okay. so he starts eating it, and he's like, oh, this is delicious. And, and he's like, drink this uh, it's wine and uh and it's really harsh and then he wakes up in the morning covered in just disgusting slime you know, like this yellow looking viscous snot stuff yeah and then he he um I, they never show him jump in the shower he's just sort of <laughs> throws on his clothes yeah. and 
goes to work. He slowly devolves into this yellow, pustule, melting human being. Uh, he he has to murder someone, and he has to, he has the drive and ferocious drive to murder someone. So when he does this, he turns back into a normal human being. But that, that's what turns him back to the human being, right? That's why I understood it. Like yeah. killing somebody allowed the slime creature to kind of go away. So that's why he had the drive to kill more and more. Yep, and uh, it's slowly revealed that the um, the landlord um, is. And all the tenants are doing this on purpose to any new person that comes in um, because the slime, I'm sorry, the yogurt is actually protoplasm, which is kind of a cool, cool angle if you're into the whole supernatural thing. You're like, okay, protoplasm, you know, it, you know, it's probably fake, but it's it has precedent if you believe in that supernatural stuff. Uh, so that being said, um, they're doing that in order to channel, uh, have, have these spirits possess them, right? So there's this sort of suicide cult in the basement. And, uh, these people made this wine and this yogurt and, uh, they had suicide pact. And so, um, they're, they're now trying to resurrect all their old friends. And so, um, the people like Roman and Lizzie are already possessed by the, these new spirits. So they're trying to recruit. So it it's um I don't know I guess it's a it's a you you could say maybe it's a little bit convoluted. Yeah, it it it, it gets there, but it never I think like gets in the way of you know it definitely never gets in the way of the the kills or transformations like the gore effects. Um, or definitely I think top notch work when you consider like this probably didn't have a huge budget. Uh, I don't think it was made by any huge production company. It was not like a trauma backed film uh any even a trauma back film they, they don't have huge budgets either but some of the gore effects are just amazing especially at the end whenever you have um i can't remember her name but uh, alex's girlfriend he, she's trying to fight him off and just a lot of top-notch stuff um throughout the scene of like you know um limbs getting chopped off his head is chopped off uh, i don't go too farther i guess to, to spoil if anybody wants to watch it but uh, the, a lot of the best war effects are done in that last, you know, ten yeah. fifteen minutes of the movie. Yeah, it really does sort of uh, sell you at the end uh, in regard to uh, the, the gore. You know, she even cuts a brain up at the end. And, that brain was impressive. Like, like, yeah, 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 um, yeah, and and man, that that shade of yellow, like what <laughs> I, you know, it, they just they nailed it as far as like that, like infected pussy yellow like it, it it's very unsettling like when the the person begins to melt uh, like when he's with the the um prostitute i'm just like what prostitute in their right mind would go anywhere near this guy it is so disgusting looking yeah that that's like a like sort of a funny trope is that like he gets mugged and the mug, mugger is like haha you and your stupid bandages and it's just it's all awful pustules and uh, everyone seems to have no problem interacting with this human no, being. Or, you know, where it's like, you know, in, in real life, they would uh, they, they, they would stay 50 yards from that person. But it's just all part of the, the great camp and, and fun and charm yeah. of the whole movie. Um, but like when he shot that like big spur, I mean, this was like a clear form of, like, I think during his first transformation, when he's at the dinner table with the girlfriend's parents and he's just like this big like thing wow, comes down yeah. it's like nobody says anything like no that. no um yeah so it's pretty interesting um you know it you know they even um bothered to to move into color theory a little bit you know as as the movie goes along his clothes start to change a little he's wearing darker colors he's turning more into like whatever lizzie or roman which are always wearing black and things like that so they you know um you know, like you're saying, great, great horror effects. And so, you know, what you're seeing is like very typical interiors of New York apartments, which most are just, you have your standard ugly white walls and um, sort of, you know, uh, furniture that's not particularly impressive. So I guess, the, but the thing is, 
that's New York, you know? So yeah. it's not a criticism. That's just kind of how it is, and especially in the mid to late 80s. I'm not, you know, New York was not, you know, whatever, Giuliani-ified, right? Uh, yeah. So, you know, it was still a fairly dangerous place to live. And, uh, you know, so I think it, it works with uh, the yeah, whole film and works. They're also college students, so it makes sense that, you know, the apartment's a little bit more sparse in terms of, you know, things that they have and things look secondhand or thirdhand mm-hmm. use. Um, so it definitely fits in. Uh, I think if there's any kind of, uh, I want to see even a gripe, um, uh, that the the lighting in the movie is kind of like it's uh, one note. Like, the, 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 for the most part, there are occasions where like, the scene with the prostitute is like it's really amazingly lit. Like I love the way that they lit that scene. But some of the other scenes, it's kind of like you can see that the on a small budget movie, you kind of like have to you know throw light everywhere you can, just so that you make sure that everything is seen, and then kind of move on to the next one. Yeah. So it's not even like a huge right, but it's if you were like a a, a film critic picking apart like little things like oh this and that, that might have been my only little gripe. Yeah, but I know you mean though. There, there are scenes that are excellent, like as far as the lighting, um, yeah. the, the some of the basement stuff. Even when he's like um, in bed, sort of writhing around, some of that stuff at night looks really good. Yeah. Um, so it's like when the lighting is good, you really notice. You're like, oh, this is really nice. And then, and then some some light, you know, some light, like you said, it's just sort of plain, you know. Um, I mean that's that's something I struggled with. Like when I was doing um, some of those uh, cheap horror movies I was doing yeah. was that, um, you know, we're shooting in like 10 days. So like you had to, it's like, we, you know, we have eight pages of dialogue to go through, you know, so you, you throw up a couple lights, bounce them off the wall and you, you get shooting, you know? Yeah. And, and if it was a conversational scene, you would, you would sort of, you know, it's like, you can understand a little bit, like if it's a dinner scene, um, maybe um, if, if you're really running low on time, throw up some lights, start shooting, and then save the finer tuned lighting for the more uh, horror based scenes. So it, it just seems to me like kind of smart directing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you could, like I say, it's very economical. Um, with the, way, the way they did it, you can tell like the certain scenes that are like you know crafted with light. You can tell that those are very important scenes. They add uh, to the importance of it too. Like the big reveal to the to the uh, the prostitute is kind of like one of the bigger face reveals. I mean, he had already killed like the the bum guy in the streets, but mm-hmm. he, it wasn't like a full on I think revelation of like what his face had really become. Um, so uh, yeah, you can tell with that lighting they wanted you to like focus in like this is an important scene where he transformed. Yeah, when he gets it gets mugged, it's an interesting. There's some interesting. Uh, Gore, the gang member, punches him in the yeah. stomach, and then his stomach chops the hand off. So, in and his stomach would sort of instantly heal. So, it's sort of like I don't know the rules of the. I mean, what they do establish is that he can get his head cut off and he's still alive. Um, he can get his guts spilled out and he's still alive. Yeah. So, I guess he just sort of has these sort of uh, supernatural powers to some degree. Yeah, that gut spilling out seems so disgusting. Oh it looked yeah, like little sausages. Or oh god, yeah, it, it looked like goulash or yeah. something. Yeah, it was so it was so gross. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know, if I was Joe Bob, I'd give it, I'd give it four stars. Um, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a cool, uh, you know, independent film. Yeah, absolutely, and it's on Amazon Prime too. If anybody wants to check it out, you got Amazon Prime. You can watch it for free. Yeah. Um, street Street Trash may be on Prime. I'm not sure but um i i got a, a blu-ray copy of street trash from uh cat and john gorman cat card and john gorman uh for my birthday and i put this blu-ray in and it's like it's gorgeous they someone took the negative scanned it did this beautiful rendition of it and i wish they could do that with uh slime city because although the amazon version is totally decent um I I just feel like there probably is some extra quality if they could they could remaster it somehow. But. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the great thing about kind of well, we we harp on the digital age a lot, but the one great thing is that there's 
been a lot of love put into um, some of these smaller films where they've gone through and they scan them in 4K, uh, remastered them, or they'll scan them in like you know 2K, do remaster and do some cleanups and stuff, and they look amazing, and it's great that they're doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think about, um, I think we were talking about it last week, like the concept of uh, growing up watching someone like Joe Bob Briggs, he presented these films, trash cinema or B-movies, as um, just as important as a Spielberg film, you know. And when I look at it, I, I actually do feel that way. I think it's because I grew up with something like an advocate of driving movies going, no, these are great. These are important. And it was tongue in cheek, but Joe Bob really loved these. He never looked down upon them, he, you know, and he he sort of liked what they stood for. They stood for, at the time, being progressive, being innovative, being ed edgy. And so if you look at, like, the concept that's, that, you know, someone who, like this guy, Greg Lamberson, who did uh, Slime City, that there may be um, a negative somewhere that could be restored. And it's not being that's that's a little disturbing, you know, to to think of how many um, films could be lost. Because um, when we interviewed Joe Bob, he talked about how during the drive-in era, if a film um, played in the grindhouses or played in the drive-ins, it would cycle through. You'd probably never see it again, and unless like five years later they wanted to bring it through as like the, the second picture. Um, um, and so there's a lot of film directors that um, had a, had a catalog of, of Grindhouse movies that let them go to waste. They let them literally rot because at the time there was, there was no VHS. It was pre VHS. So no one saw the, the value in this, you know, the second life of, of these films. So, um, and that's what's really upsetting, right? It's because just because they didn't have a huge budget or just because some A-list director wasn't attached that these things could be lost forever. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if we talked about it on the show last week or if it was off air, but Gone with the Pope, you know, this movie that I bought on Blu-ray a couple of years ago, uh, it was kind of one of those movies, Grindhouse film, that, you know, there's no, I don't think there's any big directors attached to it. There's no big actors attached to it. So it just kind of lingered. It was gone. It was you know, nobody was watching it. But um, Sage, Sage Stallone, Stallone's son, he had this, you know, like he had affinity also for these grindhouse movies, and he's uh, acquired a lot of them over the years, and they uh, done uh, gone through great lengths to restore a lot of them and then release them. Fortunately, he passed away a few years ago. But um, uh, Gone with the Pope was one of his last works that he put out there, and like that would be a movie that could easily have fallen through the cracks if it wasn't for you know. This one person, yeah. this one company. You know, so, um, it's it's there's that's a very important role. People like Joe Bob, or Sage Stallone, or I mean, you know, maybe in a small part, of what we're doing also there to, um, make people aware of some of these films and uh, you know, don't let them disappear because they're they all all films, I believe, truly have merit. You know, if you want to put them on a, a grading scale, they might have a different grade, but merit is different from I think what you can grade something. Yeah, I mean they're, they're all forms of art, and you can, uh, yeah, you can you can assign them with different value based upon you know, you know where you are in society. But um, I always thought it was strange, um, and I still believe this is true, that movies, the way people talk about movies, is just different than the way they talk about other forms of art. Like, sure, people criticize um, art installments and oil painting and photography and do shit on them. But um, I just think it's rarely in the same way. Um, I think um, because these movies, you know, so sort of people take ownership of them and they feel like they're part of them, or, or they're like, "I wish it was this. I wish it was that." Um, um, and then too, they'll like. I mean, I remember Uva Ball was doing movies, and people were like campaigning to have him stop directing things like that. So. Um, there's just it's a film I think is treated in a kind of a bizarre way um, that's not quite like other forms of art. Well, I don't think it's very often you'd hear somebody tell an artist to stop painting, stop drawing, stop making sculptures. Um, 
I mean, it, it probably has happened, but it's not like often. It's not like, um, like you said, with Bo or uh, Michael Bay. I mean, Michael Bay is a different type. I mean, like, there's, let's say, like, I enjoy his films, but I don't think, like, he should be stopped from making his films just because a lot of people don't like them. A lot of people do like them, or they're still, like, nobody's forcing the this this art on anybody like so mm. you know if you don't like the director watch the guy that you do like and let the other guy keep making the films for the people that do like him um, yeah um yes it's like you know even you know like with joe bob briggs as far as like his 24 hour marathon he you know he he's speaking his mind he's super funny when he does his sort of interstitials i call them like uh, between the, the movies uh you know, it's almost like stand-up comedy. You know? um, oh, so yeah. a lot of the stuff is is just sort of he's got this sort of like Texas perspective, and I, I actually found it really refreshing. I think he just speaks his mind clearly. He's a tolerant, kind person, but he just doesn't speak in like politically correct code. You know, um, and I know that's like sort of a trigger word these days, but. Um, well, with like sleepaway camp, there's all kinds of landmines that he could have. I mean, I think somebody else would have just tripped all over themselves with. And I, it, it, he had hilarious takes on it. Like he, he's you know, he, like I said, he is kind of like a stand-up comedian. He is making points about it, but he's not a person that wants to stop a, a transgender person from enjoying their life. He's not that type of person. No, no, he was like he goes. You know, he said something about his bathroom. Joe Bob Briggs' bathroom is open to any anyone, and very like clearly like gets along with everyone, loves everyone. Um, but you know, he'll he'll admit to liking like I think he called it lesbian slasher films, and and it, it's like it's a weird thing, right? Like parsing this thing with like he's being honest, like he. He likes that cinema, yeah. and it's sort of like, what do you do with that? Where someone's like, yeah, but I like this stuff. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, there's something refreshing about him just saying, yeah. He he had like that. I think we went over his driving, um, his driving mantra. I wonder if I have that, but um, it I thought it was really interesting because at the end of the day, it's like. It's like it almost ends up being a, a confessional that you like trash cinema. You know, it's like, um, it's, it's well, kind of annoying. I mean, I, I work at a, a university here in the city, and it's it's tough to like talk to people that you work with about like liking some of what we call trash cinema. The things that the last four movies that we reviewed for the show, I would not talk about with like the other people I work with because it's just it's it's um hard to to convey like why do you like these things because uh, i think in the general public they're not considered okay movies in in a lot of different senses and but also like also like movies that have um that are very body at times like things like trauma that have boobs and uh words that you would not say to other people um it's like yeah that was a lot of it's shock cinema and uh and we you know that was in a way, it was kind of understood that, like, someone like Howard Stern or a comedian might do, make, say something shocking, not because that, like, I mean, the humor lies in how messed up it is, you know, so it's a whole different era, like, and it's, it's sort of hard to do that nowadays, um, but, um, that's sort of where it was coming from. I feel like sometimes people, um, are missing the sort of context, right? They, they don't see the setup of the joke. They just get triggered, so they don't understand the joke. Like, let's say it's a, um, I don't know, and then, like, like James Gunn was a good example of this. Like last week, we got pulled from Guardians of the Galaxy, who started at Trauma, who you know, if you're familiar with Trauma's work, it, like you say, it's very shocking. It's uh, can be provocative at times. It's not a joke I would ever tell. Uh, oh yeah, like he had a lot of like a lot of the jokes. I'm like it was kind of weird. A lot of like a I lot of yeah. pedophilia jokes. Um, one at like within a short period of time, a little weird. However, I don't feel like he, you can tell he's being funny. In no way, in terms of I believe that James Gunn is a pedophile. 
He just his sense of humor is a little bit, a little, went a little farther than but, for a little bit for my comfort. But I think he has the right to be able to. Yeah, I can't like, I could not defend anything he wrote, but I but in the generic, um, you know, he was doing he was in that sort of exploitation realm. You know, I mean, at that point maybe he had done Slither or whatever, but um, yeah, he was um, not. Um, I I don't think him being fired was was right because apparently Disney knew about all these t- tweets and he'd done yeah. two films with them. Yeah, and he already apologized about them. I think like five or six years before this already, and he talked about how his, you know humor has changed, people grow, and we we have to be open to people growing and changing over time. And even if he didn't apologize for it, the thing is like. They were offensive, but they were done as comedy bits and not as being portrayed as a real yeah. pedophile. I mean, growing up, like, I mean, how many Michael Jackson pedophilia jokes did you yeah. hear growing up? Like, was it ever cool to tell them? Probably not, but everyone told them, you know, and it's like, um, you look back and you go, wow, that's in really bad taste, and, uh, you know. So, but the concept that you can't like grow or change your mind or, or you're guilty of something that society deemed sort of a gray area, uh, it's no longer a gray area, but it was a gray area back then that you're going to be sort of prosecuted for something that was a gray area like 10, 15 years ago. That's not really cool either. That's not really progressive. That's not really tolerant, you know, um. But so the driving oath was uh, we were driving mutants. We are not like other people. We are sick. We are disgusting. We believe in blood and breasts and in beasts. If life had a vomit meter, we'd be off the scale. As long as the drive-in remains on planet Earth, we will party like jungle animals. We will boogie until we puke. Heads will roll. The drive-in will never die. And I, I, uh, I think I mentioned this last week, but I thought, you know, it's like it's an oath, but... um. That's just so bizarre that you have to sort of like, um, that's weird. Like that, it's almost like confessional that you like this stuff. It's like violent, you know. It's like you know, look at Shakespeare. Look at look at Law and Order. Law and Order S S V U. It's like um, I mean, network TV is constantly filled with murder and rape and violence as a staple, and it's okay there, I think, because um, there's more of a clear line between the, the good people and the bad people. Yeah, I guess that's you know, how they, they can justify it. Um, I mean, if also, like, uh, I think that they also work with more of implication, implying a lot of times the murder or, or the dead body. Well, you know, try cinema. We're going we're gonna to show you <laughs> all the guts and the warts and everything. Uh, with the death, you know, and um, I think like the, these things are are I think good for society in a, a lot of ways, um, and uh, and not I mean like not saying like twelve year olds should be watching these, but they do. I mean, uh, but I think that they allow us to uh, to explore a little bit of I guess of our, our our a different part of ourselves or a different part of the mind. And they might not be who you are in your mind, but it allows your 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 mind to to go to these places without actually going to those places. And the thing is, like this stuff has always existed. Fair, you know, before Disney came along and Disney defined like a lot of the fairy tales, like a lot of them were pretty gruesome. You know, um, uh, where's the what's the one with the they put the woman in the oven? Is that Hansel and Gretel? Really and awesome. yeah, I mean they're 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 brutal. Like a lot of those old fairy tales are incredibly brutal, and and they were, I think, um, designed to warn children against the sort of evil of the world, you know. And and so, um, it is interesting in a way where we we seem to have amnesia as a, as a society. We seem to constantly forget that the stuff has always been around, and society is actually more peaceful than it's ever been. You know, um, even though it doesn't feel like it, you know, 
Um, so, but anyway, I like drive-in movies. I like the movies. Um, Slime City, I think, was great. Actually, Slime City, um, very tame. Like we said, no nudity. I mean, yeah, really, nudity, it was just uh, gross out. I don't know? even know. Like, I can't, probably can't even count on my fingers the curse words. I don't. I don't even remember any curse words really. The jump out. Well, no, yeah, I do remember the the gay term that was used. Oh yeah, the the the, uh, the mugger. The yeah. mugger, yeah. But outside of that, though, like, there's not really a lot of cursing in it. Uh, in terms of like blood, blood. There's only a few scenes of like blood. Most of it's like it's just orange, viscous, kind of pulsy looking stuff that's kind of gross. And then like when his guts fell out, say it's just like it's like a soup <laughs> more than anything. So yeah, in terms of of like pushing the limits, this movie I wouldn't say pushed any far limits. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, just a just a great great melt movie. Yeah, and uh, and we can't wait to watch the sequel, uh, Slime City Massacre, starring Debbie Roshan. So, uh, yeah, are you looking forward to uh, Sunday? Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing Debbie again. It's been since the last time that we did the interview that I've seen her. Um, uh, I really enjoyed meeting her last time. That was my first time meeting her. And uh, she's, uh, you know, uh, she's good friends with John Bloom, Joe Bob Briggs. And uh, her herself also has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to film and VHS and It'd be a good bit to go back there and see if we can dig out any more uh, nuggets. Yeah. Looking for some more information. She's in town because she's actually working on uh, uh, Lloyd Kaufman's new film, uh, Tempest, um, Shakespeare's Shitstorm. And um, I read somewhere that that um, Lloyd is claiming that this might be his last film, and I hope that's total bullshit. I don't see why it would be. Um, so they're working on that now. We've seen some pretty cool uh, behind the scenes picture of Lloyd dressed as a lovely woman, <laughs> and um, yeah, some nice games, honey. Yeah, so uh, uh, it looks like it's going well, and we'll try to get the uh, inside track from from Debbie on that. And uh, yeah, I mean that's that's about it uh, that I have. Yeah, and that's everything that I got. Uh, okay. Well. Thanks for listening. Uh, I'm your host, Tom Seymour. And I'm your other host, Ken Powell. Yeah. Check, you. Check you later. Check you later. Check you later. Sorry, I stole your line. Okay.